I already know I'm going to catch some shit for this because I say Fervolg, uh, and apparently the saying is Fearvolg. Um, I, it, you know, you say whatever you want. I, yeah, it's like Tiefling, Tifling. I, you know, you say what you want. So, Fervolg tribes cloister and remote forest strongholds, preferring to spend their days in quiet harmony within, uh, within the woods. When provoked, Furvolgs demonstrate formidable skills with weapons and druidic magic. So I always kind of feel like whenever I'm playing Furvolg, there's a there's a tendency for me to want to like get my voice down a little bit lower and talk with a little bit more like time and give everything a lot more thought, like almost like a tree beard from Lord of the Rings. Uh, and you can see in like Adventure Zone, uh, they they're doing the same thing with a new character. Uh, oh God, I wish I could remember his name. I'll post it up in here somewhere. Uh, but the new Adventure Zone campaign is actually a lot of fun, and they're also using a Furball character. But, uh, Furball traits. So, starting off, your Wisdom score increases by 2, and your Strength score increases by 1. This is drastically helpful for, like, clerics, druids, rangers, uh, you can even argue some monks, you know. Uh, your Strength score increasing by 1, and that tends to push you towards certain types of builds. Uh, different than, like, if Dexterity increased by 1, then it opens up the playing field a little bit more. But, uh, I, I really, I have been wanting to play a Furbolg Ancestral Guardian Barbarian for a long time. I would love, love, love that character, and yeah. Uh, size, Furbolgs are between 7 and 8 feet tall, and weigh between 240 and 300 pounds. Uh, your size is medium. Well, the reason I marked this in orange is because, while this doesn't directly seem like something that within the game rules is, like, really, really detrimental, I don't think it's detrimental as much as you can think that there are certain effects where your, because of your weight uh, and your size, it's going to be a bit harder to make certain things work advantageously for you. Uh, you know, like, let's say the entire party is supported by a rope, uh, trying to climb up, the DM might find a way to try and weasel this to be like, you're a bit too heavy for them to lift up. Uh, you know, if someone doesn't have a strength score of, what is it? So let's say you're 300 pounds, 300 divided by 15. Uh, let's say somebody has a strength score of 18 even. 18 times 15, 270. So, and then 20 times 15. So somebody would need a strength score of 20 in order to, like, lift you up and not it not be a huge issue. Uh, there are certain situations where I feel like this could be weaseled at with a DM. Uh, I don't feel like it's exactly, I don't want to say that it's detrimental, but I also look at this and I'm like, I, there could be some really fiddly ways that a DM could screw with a player here. You know, thin ice or something like that. Uh, your size is medium. Speed, your base walking speed is 30 feet. For bulk magic, you can cast Detect Magic and Disguise Self with this trait, using Wisdom as your spell casting ability for them. Once you cast either spell, you can't cast it again with this trait until you finish a short or long rest. Once you, uh, when you use this version of Disguise Self, you can seem up to 3 feet shorter than normal, allowing you to more easily blend in with humans and elves. So Detect Magic is a really great utility spell. Uh, with Detect Magic, you can do things like, let's get into a treasure hoard and figure out what's the important stuff to grab real quick. Like, let's say there's a timer and you can only snag so much. Pop Detect Magic, grab whatever thing you see giving off an aura, and then, like, you know, GTFO. Um, it does tell you it's School of Magic. Uh, so there could be situations where there's, like, an arcane trap somewhere nearby, like a magic missile trap. And you, by using Detect Magic, you can tell, like, okay, where is this emanating from, or whatever. Uh, Detect Magic, I think, is really useful for dungeon crawls. I really dig this spell. Uh, and you get to cast it once for free for short or long rest. Like, that's, that's so, so good. Uh, this guy's self. With this guy's self, of course, the, the conventional thing that people are thinking is uh, you can use it to appear like another creature. This is, it still works in that same, that same way. Uh, it's, I mean, it's Disguise Self. It's one of the better face spells in the game. Uh, it's fantastic. They're getting it here for free, once for short or long rest. I, I mean, you're not having to divest away from your, like, core central uh, spells known in your class in order to get these two. Uh, so that is, for Vogue Magic, fantastic. Hidden Step, I think, is their most powerful feature. As a bonus action... You can magically turn invisible until the start of your next turn or until you attack, make a damage roll, or force someone to make a saving throw. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So you turn invisible. 
An invisible creature is impossible to see without the aid of magic or a special sense. For the purpose of hiding, the creature is heavily obscured. The creature's location can be detected by any noise it makes or any tracks it leaves. Any attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage, and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. So, either way you're looking at this, you set this up with Furball Rogue, and you're popping off your sneak attack damage. As a bonus action on your turn, you go invisible and do this. That is, like, guaranteeing that you're going to knock off your sneak attack damage. Uh, also, one of the big reasons why people have told me they really love, love, love Hidden Step is because with something like a cleric trying to cast Cure Wounds, this allows you to go invisible, run over to your buddy without provoking any opportunity attacks, help your friend out, get them up, and then, like, go back into the fight. Uh, this is crazy awesome. I love, love Hidden Step. This is a racial feature is so, so good. So freaking good. So with Powerful Build, Powerful Build seems to be the, the feature that they are slapping onto races in order to make up for them, like, not getting the large size. So you count as one size larger when determining your carrying capacity and the weight you can push, drag, or lift. So Powerful Build is, uh, like... <sighs> At most, it's going to make you a pack mule. I personally feel that powerful build, at most, the fact that it doesn't work with, like, grapple checks. Like, if this worked with grapple checks, all oh, this feature would be so cool. Like, honestly, powerful build not working for grapple checks might be, like, a bit of just... Uh, it would have been better in hindsight. Speech of Beast and Leaf. You have the ability to communicate in a limited manner with beasts and plants. They can understand the meaning of your words, although you have no special ability to understand them in return. You have advantage on all charisma checks you make to influence them. At early levels, whenever, like, wolves are more common on the random encounter rolls, uh, this is something that I feel like is going to be really impactful if played the correct way. This can potentially let you negotiate your way out of fights, and honestly, like, in D&D, just because an encounter is rolled up, that does not mean that you should fight every single encounter. You know, like, be prepared that... Like, if something looks tough, take that as a sign that you should GTFO. You don't have to fight every battle. And I know most players are just expecting to fight every battle. Sometimes it's more interesting to negotiate your way out of a situation, and it could be a way more rewarding experience. Languages you can speak, read, and write, common, and two given languages here, so Elvish and Giant. Uh, Giant, I really love. Uh, personally, in my world, my homebrew world, uh, I use Giant as kind of the language of elders, if, like, if you're going to speak in runes, uh, decipher, like, I, there's a, Giants can inject a really cool element of, like, what are elder races in your world, and yeah, if you, if you just think that Giants are going to be the dopey, like, you know, fee fi fo foam kind of Giants, you should really check out some videos by, like, Esper the Bard or uh, uh, AJ Pickett on Giants because there is a lot of really cool lore out there for these uh, monsters. So, uh, starting out here with the Furbolg, the Detect Balance guys, I've given it a 26. Uh, I actually think it should be a little bit higher than this. Uh, the 26 tends to be where they view that uh, races are around the point of, like, average balance for 5e. I think Furbolg is... a probably a little bit higher, closer to 30. So, getting into this, let me make sure that this is all going to get centered. So, getting into my ratings, uh, Furvolg is at least a baseline B. Uh, I honestly feel that the invisibility and the innate magic is strong enough to at least carry them up to a flat line B across the board. Uh, so, starting out, Artificer B, uh, they just don't really have anything helping out their intelligence score or anything else that the Artificer is really prioritizing in. For Volg Barbarian, I, I had to knock it down to an A. I, I, other than the one point of strength, there's just nothing else other than, like, the, they're already strong features that are really bolstering up this pairing. Uh, it's a shame because I really, really want to play for Bulk Barbarian, and I, I just, I love that idea. I love the, like, Ancestral Guardian for Bulk as, like, a character concept. Uh, so thematically, you can tell I wish for Bulk Barbarian could be, like, it, it's thematically an S plus for me. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, Bard, B. And again, same thing with Artificer. Uh, Bard's prioritizing Charisma. So with Blood Hunter, uh, Matt Mercer did make a change where this is no longer valuing Wisdom as high as it is valuing Intelligence now. So these have unfortunately fallen from grace. 
Uh, Bloodhunter Dex is a B, Bloodhunter Strength is an A. For a Volt Cleric is where this pairing is really going to start to shine. Uh, here they're an S+, plus, absolutely, especially in strength-based builds. Uh, if you look at your domain and it gives you a Divine Strike, that is a big signal that, like, hey, you should probably consider going frontline with this Cleric. Uh, so, Cleric, S+, plus, absolutely. You get all the help from your Wisdom. There's the help of... Uh, Cure Wounds is a little bit easier to pop off because you get to go invisible, get closer to an ally, cast a spell, and you're not provoking opportunity attacks in doing so. It's just fantastic, fantastic. Forge Domain, uh, sure, it's an S+, plus, but I think thematically that's kind of blah. Uh, but, yeah, it's you're you're usually going strength-based builds with that. I list Forge Domain here mostly because uh, of... Races that get resistance to fire damage, this is something that I feel is a redundancy that's hard enough and detrimental enough to where if you do pair like a red dragonborn with forged domain, uh, that does tend to knock off some points for me. Druid, S+, plus, this the plus two to whiz, the strength score... Honestly, Druid's not really valuing that all that highly. However, like with Druid, you're going to be wild shaping and using the strength decks and con scores of whatever you're wild shaping into. Fighter decks B, fighter strength A, same reasons I said for the Blood Hunter. Uh, Cavalier, I think thematically could be a lot of fun because now you're able to actually like kind of communicate easier with your mount. Uh, B for the Eldritch Knight because they're not getting help to their intelligence. Uh, Magus, uh, the, really the only one that you're going to be looking at is quite honestly Wisdom, in which case this is absolutely an S plus pairing, especially with melee builds. There's one of the Magus subclasses that's all about uh, the, the classic like Warden of Nature kind of archetype, and I mean the Furvolk Magus just fits that perfectly. Uh, but for Charisma intelli and Intelligence, the Furvolk is unfortunately at a B. Monk A+, plus, simply because you're getting the plus 2 to your Wisdom, and everything else is helping you out, sure. Uh, you, could, you could say that the bonus action to go invisible is actually more helpful to Monk because you're not having to blow key points to do Step of the Wind. So, it could be argued that this might be an S, but uh, yeah, as I've currently got it setting, A+. Plus. Mystic Scion, B. Uh, Paladin, S+. Uh, absolutely, the Paladin, you, sure you're getting your plus one of strength, you're also getting your plus two to your uh, strong save for the class. Uh, though you're not getting the plus two to your charisma, I do think that everything else that they get in combination with that, and the argument that you're getting the plus two to your strong save, is enough to say that like Paladin is very likely an S pairing with Furbolg. Go like, uh, what is it, Oath of the Ancients? Like, oh, yeah. Pugilist, unfortunately, is an A. Good God, if Powerful Build worked with Grappling, that would be such a dope character concept. Uh, however, you're only getting the plus one to your strength. Everything else is kind of bolstering you up, but yeah. So, Ranger Dex, A. Uh, Ranger Strength, a, uh, S+. Plus. This is all because they're plus two to Wiz. They are getting incredible effects that are allowing them just to do some of the things you would think Ranger would be doing with the Ranger playstyle even better. Uh, they are, everything about this pairing is directly enhancing it. I think Furbolg Ranger, like, strength builds are probably my favorite match on this entire, in, entire table. Okay, making a little bit of room here. So, Furbolg Rogue, uh, I have this at an A. I'm, I'm fighting with myself here on the Furbolg Rogue rating. I've given it an A, and I'm trying to hold myself to a, a good standard here to where I'm like, okay, if the ability score improvements that I've, I've really based the core of this whole table off of aren't synergetic, I can't reasonably give it an S rating. So, I know that this pairing can be potentially absolutely incredible. You are virtually guaranteeing your sneak attack damage once every fight. Like, I mean, being able to go invisible, pop out, do the damage, I mean, like, that's, this is a crazy awesome pairing. Uh, you're getting Detect Magic, which feels very into the Rogue playstyle. You're getting Disguise Self, which is absolutely part of the Rogue playstyle. Yeah, it's just the only issue is just they don't have the complementary ASIs. So, across the board, unfortunately, I have to, have to, have to keep Rogue at an A. Uh, however, I do feel like it could be argued that this is an S, if not S plus, rating. 
So I have actually changed the last four ratings on here. I bumped up the Scholar, Warlock, and Wizard to an A from a B uh, because they're getting a plus two to their strong save that they're given in the class. So that's about it, though, for the synergy. Uh, the rest of it's just really based off of how strong Hidden Step and Furball of Magic are. Scholar prioritizing Intelligence, Sorcerer prioritizing uh, Charisma and either Dex or Constitution, Warlock, same thing, Wizard, uh, Intelligence, and either Dex or Constitution. So that is going to be it for the Furvolg. This has been a process. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, I hope you guys like the new layout. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Have you played Furvolg before? You know the drill. Let me know what you think of this race. Is there something I missed? Something I'm just not thinking of right here at the moment? Please, please feel free to comment down below. Uh, I am totally stoked to have that conversation with you guys. Uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you. I hope that you're staying safe, staying healthy, and I hope to see you in the next one.